Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon and welcome to this event from the Asia Scotland Institute. My name is Martin Perbrick, I'm the Institute Director. Uh, our focus today is a discussion with David Andelman, author of the newly published book, A Red Line in the Sand, Diplomacy, Strategy and the History of Wars That Might Still Happen. Um, and I think the title says it all about the content really, um, and, and quite a fascinating title and extraordinary content. Um, I, I won't say anything about the book, we'll leave that to David. Um, but if I could say something about David, first of all, uh, because he has a, a, a tremendous um, uh, experience as a journalist and a writer, and it's well worth recounting. Uh, David was the editor of the World Policy Journal from 2008 until 2015. He served as an executive editor at Forbes, as a business editor at the New York Daily News, as Washington correspondent for CNBC, uh, and as a reporter, correspondent, and bureau chief for the New York Times, covering Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, and New York. Uh, and, I, and I guess, David, that was back in the days when, um, for those of us overseas, it was the Herald Tribune, which, um, which was always the newspaper to read, I found, uh, traveling anywhere. Uh, following the New York Times, he served for seven years as Paris correspondent for CBS News. And, and obviously, that's an extraordinary journalistic career, which gives him great insight and qualifies him to talk about issues in uh, across the world geopolitically. So David is not only a journalist, he's the author of multiple books, in fact you'll see them on his bookshelf, I'm sure he can introduce some later, um, including A Shattered Peace, Versailles 1919 and The Price We Pay Today, um, which is a look at some of the world's current geopolitical problems and tracing them back to the Treaty of Versailles after World War One. He's also the co-author of The Fourth World War, Diplomacy and Espionage in the Age of Terrorism, uh, as well as a book of memoirs and opinion with Alexandre de Maranche, a former head of French intelligence. I, I, I hadn't read these books before, but David, I will be trying to uh, pick them up. So if I could um, now introduce uh, Roddy Gal, chairman and founder of Asia, Asia Scotland Institute, and um, Roddy will take us through the discussion with David. Thank you very much. Martin, thank you, and uh, and again, welcome to David. He and I are in the same time zone here on the east coast of the uh, United States, but it's a great pleasure to, to welcome you, David. Um, the, the book, which I have here, and which you should all have in your hands if you order it, it's available very rapidly uh, on Amazon, uh, is really rather remarkable. And I'm going to quote uh, Richard Gallant, the managing editor of CNN Opinion, who writes, in his vital new book, David Andelman deftly marshals a wealth of examples from diplomatic and military history. He urgently alerts us to the seeds of future conflicts, as well as the opportunities for making peace. And uh, another comment by Tom Brokaw, who we all will know, is Andelman is one of our most experienced national security journalists, timely and insightful. So David, it's so good to talk to you. And I'm going to kick off by asking you the, the question of what, what motivated you to write this book in the first place? Well, Roddy, thank you. And thank you and, and uh, Martin and the uh, Asia Scotland Institute. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, Scotland is one of my favorite parts of the world, especially um, some of its um, beverages. And um, Asia, of course, is one of my favorite parts of the universe as well. So. Um, Let's start with what, what led me to write this book. Well, actually, it's, it's it had an interesting history. Um, several years ago, uh, a, a two French journalists, a distinguished French journalist, one of them the um, the, for, the head of the um, uh, Agence France Press Bureau at the Elysee Palace, Presidential Palace in Paris, came to me and said that they um, they wanted to do a book about the uh, the, the uh, Obama's uh, red line with Syria and uh, everything that happened, and they had excellent access. Um, to um, uh, Francois Hollande, President Hollande's, um, um, uh, his, his, all of his archives and, and, and he himself as well. Um, and, um, and a number of other people who were involved in this from the French, the British and the American side, but they wanted me to have a look at the American side of this. So I it sounded interesting. I began uh, researching this and discovered um, two important facts. One, um, the uh, Obama administration, this was the one foreign policy failure. They had one real foreign policy failure. And this was a deep embarrassment to a lot of the folks who were involved in this. They really did not want to talk anymore about it. And second of all, it really, there wasn't much left to, re, to be unraveled there because it simply had been explored in enormous detail uh, in, in magazine pieces at the time and in newspapers and so on. It just didn't seem to me that there was enough new material to really uh, build a book around. But I became interested in red lines. 
So I began researching that. And it occurred to me that um, I had in fact experienced quite a number of these red lines, crossed them or been prevented from crossing them uh, all over the world in the course of my travels and reporting from over 80 countries. And it might be interesting to just look at the whole, the history, the structure, the morphology and the future of red lines and, and how they've worked in the past or failed or often failed in the past and worked, but at times worked. And what makes them working or failing and, and the lessons that we could learn from that in the future. And the final um, item that I, dis I discovered is that there really are more red lines in existence in the world today than any other single moment in history. Some of that is attributed, of course, to Donald Trump and some of his unfortunate, um, um, shall we say, escapades or, or lack of understanding of how um, history works and how uh, world affairs really are structured. But a lot of it has to do with the structure of red lines themselves and, and how they have developed over the years. So that's how the book, sorry, this is kind of a, a long a saga of how the book came about, but um, that's, I think, the, um, the answer to your question, I hope. David, yes, thank, thank you. Um, and what about the origins of the term red line? I think you take us back to the Crimean War. Well, actually, I can take you back a lot further than that. Uh, there's two halves of the title, remember. It's a red line in the sand. The red line concept has been around since really ancient times. And, and in fact, the sand refers really to in reference in the book of John in the New Testament, when um, Pharisees brought an adulteress to, to Jesus and said, uh, you know, Mosaic law requires that she be stoned to death. And Jesus drew a line in the sand and said, he who is without sin step across that line and may stone her. And of course, nobody dared to do that. So the red line itself, but you're quite right, dates back to the Crimean War. And it was 1854. And the battle was the Battle of Balaclava. Um, it was, remember, it was the uh, forces of Britain, France, and Turkey against Russia. The war was reaching its peak at that point. Balaclava was under siege on the, in the Crimea on the coast of the Black Sea. Um, and there was a, a battle uh, brewing then. On the British side, the 93rd Highlanders under Sir Colin Campbell. Uh, taken refuge from the long-range Russian artillery behind a crest of the rise that they'd been commanding. Advancing on the British, though they weren't quite aware of their, really where they were located, were the four Kiev Hussar squadrons, uh, the, the, the Cossacks. Um, suddenly Campbell ordered the Highlanders to show themselves, appearing apparently from nowhere, blocking the entire path of the advancing Hussar cavalry and threw the Russians into utter confusion. Um, anyway, the Times of London's great, brilliant war correspondent, William Howard Russell, was there. He chronicled the whole thing. Let me just read you very briefly um, what he said. The ground flew beneath their horses' feet, gathering speed at every stride. He was talking to them about the Huskars. They dashed on towards that thin red streak tipped with a line of steel, the red streak being the streak of the uh, British uh, soldiers' uniforms and the line of steel being their fixed bayonets. That was in fact morphed into eventually um, to uh, the thin red line, it was misquoted, but it became part of history. And that's where the origins can be traced to of the thin red line uh, as, a, as an actual concept. But the, the idea of it, of course, goes back and I trace this in, in virtually every part of the world, there are instances of, of red lines back to the earliest of times, thousands of years, men, even before the common era. Yeah, well, that's something for, for the, us Scots to take some pride in, so that's good. Let's, let's just talk about, if we may, many of the red lines that you highlight arose from boundaries or demarcation lines drawn up in the past. I'm thinking of Sykes-Picot, I'm thinking of uh, in the line in Afghanistan between Afghanistan and Pakistan, the Durand line. Um, to what extent are the red lines of which you speak, uh, if you like, the, the, the successors of boundaries that were drawn up by cartographers and others uh, many years ago? Well, some of them were drawn by cartographers. Some of them were drawn by natural selection. Uh, basically, the, um, uh, a lot of the red lines, particularly in the Middle East, are drawn by natural boundaries um, and in other parts of the world as well. You mentioned the Durand line. That is the line between that the British said it was very interesting between what they saw as civilization and, and every place else, utter confusion and, and dismay on the other side of that line in Afghanistan. Um, so they basically wanted the um, they wanted to control the Raj on the on the eastern and southeastern uh, frontiers of, of that line, uh, and on the other side, far side was 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 the um, the, uh, the tribes and the and the um, the murderous tribes of, of the Afghanistan uh, uh, region. 
but but there are other interesting red lines as well. I mean, you go back, for instance, um, uh, you mentioned Sykes Picot, but but also um, uh, Munich. Remember, at the uh, at the start of World War II, I go into that in some detail. That was a very important red line. Uh, uh, Chamberlain thinking that he had established a red line that that um, Hitler had respect and, and would honor, and uh, and so on. And so he came back and then waved a piece of paper when he got off the plane and in uh, London, saying we have peace in our time. Of course, that was was sadly misled uh, by Hitler. Uh, Churchill, in fact, recognized that, but um, uh, he was one of the very few at the time who did. And that red line failed to hold on a number of different occasions. And finally, the uh, Sudetenland gave, gave, gave way to all of Czechoslovakia, which gave way in turn to the invasion of, of Poland, uh, crossing that red line between Poland and Germany. And that was the beginning, of course, of World War, World War II. And I go into lines like that all over the world, where, just as an example, you mentioned cartographers, the, the red line of the 38th parallel in, in Korea. Very interesting how that was drawn. It was drawn actually uh, in the dead of night around sometime after midnight in the old executive office building in Washington, uh, where uh, Dean Rusk was then a young colonel uh, in, the, in the army. Um, and a couple of his colleagues were trying to uh, decide where, the, where the, uh, the line should be drawn between the communist north and the and the South. Um, and they, they took out a National Geographic map. Um, uh, Rusk saw a line of 38 parallels. It seems like a pretty good space. So let's let's say it's at the 38th parallel. And that's exactly what happened. And that line still exists physically today. It's been replaced, of course, by a number of other lines involving nuclear arms, uh, weaponry, and so on, uh, which have made things vastly more complicated across that entire, entire peninsula. But um, so that's, there are, the, the, the way red lines are drawn and how they're drawn and, and, and what they respect or don't respect are some of the most critical aspects of, of the functioning or non-functioning of a red line. You, you also talk about NATO um, and Article 5, which of course, as we all know, is, is an attack on one, is an attack on all, uh, and how that's been tested in the, uh, almost in the, the Baltic states. Um, and how, if you like, NATO drew a, red, drew a red line around itself in that respect. Could you give us a bit more information on that and comment on that, David? Yes, well, it's interesting because I do believe that the red line of NATO, that is the line that surrounds all of the NATO countries, has really been the most single most inviolable red line, uh, most effectively preserved in history of, of red lines, period, anywhere in the world. It really has worked very effectively. About the only, it has been tested on several occasions, Obviously, Putin has tried to test it on a number of different occasions. He's a physically and, and in um, um, and, and in and cyberspace. Um, but the only time it was really, really tested was in Estonia. And you quite rightly point out in Estonia uh, several years ago, um, the, um, the Russians, Putin, of course, claims that it wasn't his the government, of course, that was doing it, but of course, it was the government. Uh, they basically tried to take down the entire Estonian uh, net, uh, internet system, web system. Um, and they did so very effectively for over a week, in fact. Uh, as a result, it was a result of the um, Estonians deciding they were going to move a, a Russian war memorial from downtown uh, Tallinn, the capital of Estonia, out into the, um, into the sort of the suburbs or on the outskirts. Um, but the Russians uh, didn't like that very much. In fact, the Russian-speaking uh, Estonians didn't like that very much either. Um, but um, they did it, and it was a challenge. Uh, they threw down the gauntlet to the to the, to, the, to the Russians, and the Russians in turn decided to take down their entire um, internet system using a, um, a series of DNS attacks, a denial of service attacks. And it worked, it worked very well for a while. But the fact that it, it did not trigger Article 5, the, the Prime Minister of Estonia told me several years later, was because nobody was actually hurt by this. No one died, no one was seriously wounded. This was not considered a physical attack. So they did not want to use the precedent of a a physical attack to invoke Article 5. They could have, but they didn't. But it was quite clear that um, Putin got the message. Uh, this was not to be, tri they were not to be trifled with in that respect. And sure enough, I mean, the other, Ukraine is not a member of NATO. Uh, Georgia is not a member of NATO. The places where Putin has made his most um, determined efforts to try to enlarge his, his own red lines that surround that country uh, have been made in, in non-NATO setting. Looking at, uh, looking at your book, what are the, the three most likely red lines that could cause war? And I, I say this too, um, in the knowledge that you wrote a coda after first publishing this, which of course 
brought us up to date and we will talk about the South China Seas, I'm sure. Um, the three red lines that the, the crossing of which would be most likely to result in conflict, David. Well, it's quite clear that um, North Korea could touch off a war simply by firing a, um, a nuclear tipped missile somewhere um, or, or, or this, this crosses a red line that is clearly not, not, not viable. Um, Iran, I think, could, um, could certainly touch off a conflict um, in its own way of, by continuing to press toward a, um, uh, a nuclear um, device. And I'm not sure if they're going to do that, frankly. I think they're going to try to you know, go right up to the edge of that and so on. Uh, I think those are two very concerning lines. I think um, it's interesting that you mentioned this because I think in some respects, um, Africa is a potential hotspot, some hotspots there. But, but I must tell you, I think that I, I'm very doubtful that a world war is going to develop, <coughs> excuse me, um, as a result of red lines or indeed in anything else. I think the stakes are just far too high. And I think virtually all of the players recognize the stakes are far too high. You know, during the entire Cold War era, era a peace was um, ensured by this concept of MAD, mutually assured destruction, which is to say, if the Russians fire their missiles at America, they can be absolutely sure that we will have enough missiles left to destroy them completely. Now, mutually assured destruction began to deteriorate uh, after a number of other countries began developing deliverable nuclear warheads. But um, I still think that whole concept is is still very much alive today. And I think China will, will also, will particularly China, we should talk about China very soon, I hope. China, I think, will press the, um, uh, the United States and other Western powers as far as they can up to a certain point, but they understand that they don't want war. And um, it was interesting, I was talking last week with uh, Michelle Flournoy, who was uh, Obama's Deputy Secretary of Defense, the highest ranking woman uh, in, the, in the Defense Department. And, and she was telling me, she said, you know, China doesn't want a war. We don't want a war with China. And it's just not going to happen. And, and so I think that um, it's very clear, but we have to really make sure that we, all of the, the concepts that would prevent that war remain in place. Let's talk about China then, if we may. Uh, and of course, before we started this call, you mentioned the fact that China has imposed um, essentially sanctions on key members of Trump's outgoing administration or gone administration. Um, and so there's still a lot of tension there. It'll be interesting to see how they believe Biden, President Biden is going to interact with them. Talk to us about the South China Seas then and, and what you see is going to happen there, David. Well, the South China Sea, I devote a, a substantial chunk of my book to the South China Sea. I think it is a very, it is an absolutely critical uh, location to look at, to examine. And both with respect to how the uh, Chinese are are using it as their basically their front yard, if you will, uh, and the uh, and the and the, the countries uh, bordering the South China Sea, uh, many of the ASEAN countries, um, uh, you know, um, the Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, um, uh, Vietnam, especially, um, and, and uh, further afield, uh, Taiwan, and then um, Japan, how they're reacting to uh, the Chinese military presence in the South China Sea, which is growing, which is extraordinary, which is very powerful. Um, and which is conceivably destabilizing. But, um, you know, again, uh, I think that the growth of, and, and what's interesting to examine in the South China Sea is how these, this whole red line web, and it is a web of red lines, um, grew to begin to, to the point where it is now. Uh, remember at one point um, back you know, hundreds of years, 500 years ago, the, um, the South China Sea was, uh, was basically used by China to trade with a number of its neighbors as far afield as, as, um, as India uh, and the Middle East, uh, the Arab countries. Um, but there wasn't any sense of, of ownership of the South China Sea in that respect. The ownership began really at the end of the uh, Mao Zedong's era when they discovered that there are ways of taking the small little islands. There are over 130 different small islets and, and just hundreds and hundreds of reefs and, and other um, structures within the uh, South China Sea. And they could transform these by um, substantial military uh, construction into really fortified um, emplacements within the South China Sea, around each of which they basically sent, set a 12 mile red line or territorial limit. So past that territorial limit, you're effectively invading China. And, and this is a very, very troubling aspect of the whole relationship between the outside world and, and China, because you know um, huge quantities, uh, over a trillion dollars worth of traffic uh, commerce passes through the South China Sea every year. Um, 
In fact, a third of all traffic between China and the, and the West passes through the South China Sea. So it, it's really very important that um, that, that, that remain an open and, and, and viable waterway uh, in the future without being overly militarized. And I'm not sure China understands the necessity of doing that. It's essential that the, the, Western, the Western powers, particularly the United States, and the countries bordering that also make clear that they are not going to tolerate China just basically seizing that as their own waterway. So David, how, sh how should military leaders now uh, in this, uh, this time when people talk about the Thucydides trap, rising China, uh, the United States of America trying to decide what it's gonna be and what it's doing, how, how should military leaders plan to deal with the sorts of scenarios you've spoken about? Because when we talk about red lines in the sand, it's normally the failure of, of a, a head of state or a military leader to actually carry out uh, the, the, the threat that, that if someone crosses that line, they will react. Most notably, of course, that happened in Syria. What's your advice to people trying to construct a sensible strategy? Well, first of all, I, I think we have to understand how red lines work, how they, how, how they operate. The only way they really succeed is if both sides, both parties on both sides of that line, understand and basically accept the existence of that red line and its viability. Where it doesn't work or is destabilizing is when it doesn't. Just as an example, um, Obama's uh, Syrian red line on chemical weapons. Uh, it's, a, it's, a one, it's a fine idea. The problem was it was tossed off as kind of a, um, you know, an off the cuff from Mark at a press conference having nothing to do with that, having to do with Obama's basic um, his domestic economic policy. Um, when someone asked, uh, actually, um, someone asked a question of, of him, uh, you know, what about the Syrian, um, the Syrian use of um, chemical weapons on his own people? And he said, that is a red line that we will not tolerate. But he just kind of created that, you know, out of the blue without much uh, advanced thinking about how that would be enforced, how it might function, and how it might uh, affect the, the uh, operations of um, Bashar al-Assad, the, the dictator in Saudi Arabia, uh, in, in uh, Syria. So it, it's very important, I think, to for each, for all military leaders, but not only military leaders, the civilians who basically, hopefully, will control the, the, these military leaders to understand what is involved in these red lines and, and how they should or cannot work effectively. And, and I think people are really beginning to understand and come to grips with that, but they really need, and I think a lot of that was forgotten during the Trump years when basically the, 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 the use of military force was on very much on an ad hoc basis. Troops were, were, were withdrawn or dispatched uh, um, at will by just the whim of the, um, uh, our, our Supreme Leader. Um, and, and this was an, an unfortunate, um, uh, an experiment that did not work and could not work. We just must have a very good sense of, of where force is important, where it's necessary, where it might work, and where it should be withheld from, um, but also where it must be continued to be, um, to be used or at least um, available. And so I'm, I'm particularly concerned about the um, Trump's legacy in terms of the withdrawal of forces from Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, you know, Trump was was very, he, he and, and his um, acting defense secretary, uh, Miller, uh, they, were, they were very proud of themselves that they had gotten down American forces down to 2,500 uh, in, in each of those locations. I'm not sure that's something to be proud of. I think the, 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 the use of military and the deployment of military forces has to be, must be dependent in some fashion on the diplomacy surrounding those forces. And, and the diplomacy surrounding that has certainly not been in any sense established effectively. Yeah, I very much agree with that. Yeah, David, I'm going to pass over now to to Martin, uh, the, the institute director, because I think he has some questions, and then we will open it up to others who are who are on the call. Excellent. Thanks, Martin. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, you, you've inspired me even more to buy the book and read it. So uh, when I can get it from Amazon, I will. Don't worry. Um, I'd like to come back to something Roddy touched on, and uh, and and you've talked about in several questions from Roddy. Um, about the different perspectives of red lines. Um, and, and, and I wonder, can red lines be seen differently from, from different nations? Um, I, unfortunately, we come back to China quite often and the nature of their red lines, which we don't necessarily understand. I think there's an interesting example that I suspect you touch on in the book. Um, General Douglas MacArthur, when, um, when his troops reached the Yalu River in the Korean War, 
Um, actually, I suspect some in the US policy establishment did understand that red line, but MacArthur clearly didn't. Um, and, and MacArthur himself, it seems, may have been willing. Um, well, I think he was willing to use nuclear weapons at that time. And, um, and it seems that, that Mao Zedong was also very willing to use nuclear weapons. And he understood that his view was that they had such huge defense in depth in China that um, they, could, they could undertake a nuclear war, which, which, which may come back to this, um, this mad strategy, as you said, um, it may come back to the mad president strategy as well, which, which we come across quite often where uh, heads of um, uh, State Department and, and other government foreign services portray their own president as slightly mad and uncontrollable so that they can put the other party off balance and make it, gives it clear. Used love, gives me used to love to use that with Nixon, actually. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I know you, you know Kissinger, and, and I'm sure you can talk about it. So per perhaps you could talk a little bit about that. Do we fully understand red lines from different countries? And, and, and do countries deliberately make those red lines unclear? No, I don't, I don't think we necessarily do. And I don't think a lot of our leadership does. Um, the, the, um, the red line in, in China, uh, MacArthur and the, and the Yellow River is very interesting. Um, you, you know, the, um, the, the Chinese did not want to get involved in, in Korea at all um, until the, uh, they got the permission of Stalin. And Mao apparently asked Stalin, or he sent an emissary to ask Stalin, can we, in fact, um, can, can we cross into North Korea and, and take on the Americans there? Will you have our backs? Yeah. And um, Stalin was reluctant to do that at first, but finally he said, yes. He said, at, at, the, at the least, I will, I will have your, your backs from the air. And so finally, that is what uh, finally forced, uh, allowed um, China to send in troops uh, into, into, into North Korea. Uh, MacArthur, I think, did not really believe that the Chinese were prepared to invade in, in the sense, in the way that they did. Uh, whole hog. I think he also did not believe that um, that Russia would would back them, especially with air power, which they did, and which was very effective, at least initially. Um, when the when Soviet planes began showing up uh, over the battlefields, this was a, a great concern, obviously, to the Americans. So um, you're right. I think people have to understand. You know, you have to understand who your ally, who your allies are. I mean, one of the problems with red lines under under the during the Trump years is that Trump never really understood the value of having allies, alliances, and, and um, people to back you up, as it will. Obama did understand that. And in fact, uh, on his red line with, um, with Syria, um, when, um, when the British parliament uh, refused to go along with what was supposed to have been a tripartite attack on Syria by the, by the British and the French, um, that was what uh, persuaded Obama that he really needed to think seriously about whether that line was, was worth or was, was, was ready to be honored and, and accepted, which I might say hung um, Francois Hollande out to dry because the French had been willing to go in uh, from the beginning. You know, they were gung ho, they had their um, Raj fighters um, all warmed up and, and um, um, on, the, on the carriers are on with cruise missiles ready to attack. Uh, and, and none of that happened. So um, I, I think it, it really is under, important to understand, first of all, what your alliances are who's backing you on each side, and what the stakes are as well. And once you've decided that, then you can decide, A, is this red line worth establishing, or is it B, is it worth sustaining? Yep, yep. Does that yep. help? Not... Go on. Does that yep. help? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I hope it helps the uh, incoming officials in the State Department as well. <laughs> I hope they read your book. Um, I, I know we tend to get a bit um, stuck on China. It's it's unfortunate, but it's inevitable um, these days because um, of how, how huge a country it is and, and how powerful it is economically and increasingly politically. Um, perhaps could, could you say something about the situation in India, how you see that? Um, this this rather complex geographical area with um, in the Himalayas, with um, the border with China. Um, uh, obviously, India, which is a complex part of India, Aksai Chin, um, Ladakh, Jammu Kashmir, Kashmir the Sichuan Glacier, Glacier um, Indian Administrative Kashmir, Pakistan Administrative Kashmir. How, how do you see the red lines here, if there are any? Are, are they clear to all the parties involved? Well, I think, uh, and, and I didn't really get into this in the book in that, in that great detail, which, by the way, was um, one of the principal um, uh, questions by a very close friend of mine, Mira Kamdar, who was um, a great India expert. She's a former um, columnist for the New York Times, and, and I've known Mira for years. 
uh, she is herself um, uh, of Indian origin. Um, she said, well, you should have talked more about the India-China frontier. Well, the fact is the India-China red line is very clear. I mean, that border is very clear. There's never really been any discussion on it. It's a tense border and there have been incursions along it from time to time. But I don't think either country really has any great in interest in, in starting a war um, along that Indian, um, uh, Indian Chinese border. Uh, I just don't think it, it doesn't really solve any of their problems. Um, the Chinese are obviously going to get very worked up if the Indians begin messing in Tibet in some fashion. So they've kind of backed off that. Uh, I think the Chinese are very sensitive to the fact that India is probably going to surpass them in, in terms of the population uh, very soon. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that in turn, population equates, in, population equates economic power and so on. So that's entirely a, uh, that's a concern obviously of, of Xi Jinping. Um, but, but I don't think again, that this is a, an area, any of these areas are really where wars are going to break out. Uh, hopefully, I hope I'm right about that. Um, I've been wrong in, in other cases in the past, but not very often. But I, I just, knowing that area, and I've traveled through that area, uh, I've been in Bhutan, uh, I've been in uh, both Pakistan and India, um, Kashmir. Uh, it's obviously an area of great sensitivity, but it's also an area where I think both sides understand the stakes and the, and the reasons for maintaining the frontiers as they exist now, rather than as um, you know, they, they might have if, if there was some sort of a war um, involved. Yeah. Um, perhaps we can move away from China a little bit because, um, as I said, we tend to get a little, uh, we, we dwell on China more, more than we should perhaps, uh, and go back to some of the more traditional problem areas, um, especially the Middle East. Um, so despite the, um, I think we can say havoc is an appropriate word, uh, resulting from several of the wars there, what are the remaining red lines? And, and especially perhaps in relation to Israel and Iran. So th this, this red line about Iranian nuclear power and, and obviously leading to a, a nuclear weapons capability from Iran has been um, projected as a red line for Israel and, and probably the USA as well for some time. But it, it seems to be a shifting red line because um, clearly the Iranian uh, regime does have access to some sort of nuclear capability through their research when they can activate it and operationalize it is another matter. How do you see those red lines in the Middle East at the moment? Well, you have to remember the red lines between, um, between Iran and some of its neighbors, particularly Iraq um, and, 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 and Saudi Arabia, those go back a thousand years, back to the time of Mohammed or just after Mohammed, uh, when Sunnis and Shiites uh, split. And there's been a red line between the Sunni and Shiite uh, nations, you know, religions, uh, mm. sects or what have you, um, for a thousand years. That's not going to change very much. Um, what is going to change are the power structures on both sides of these red lines, uh, this red line. And, and, and that's where things have been shifting and, and uh, morphing and, and, and causing considerable concern. I frankly don't think that Iran, um, I think Iran would like to have a, um, a, a nuclear capability. Uh, I don't know that it wants a nuclear weapon because I think it understands the, the dangers of having a nuclear weapon in a part of the world where other countries such as Israel particularly have a nuclear deliverable nuclear device and have had it for years and no one understand how to use it. So um, I, I think that what, you know, Iran is, is not a monolith also. It is torn by a host of different factions. And at this point, um, these factions range from the relatively liberal, the factions, the bazaaris, I like to call them, people who, who run the bazaar, run the economy of, 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 uh, of Iran. They're very relatively liberal. They want relations with the West. They want to do banking in the West. They want their kids to be able to go to school in America or England or Scotland. Um, but they, um, so they, 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 they want uh, some kind of a resolution of this uh, amicably in some fashion. Now, all the way to the other extreme, you go through the Revolutionary Guard Corps, all the way to the most extreme um, Ayatollahs, um, including the uh, Supreme Leader, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei. Um, but again, Khamenei also understands the limits of his, on his power. He also understands the limits that are um, opposed on him by other issues that are involved. For instance, um, you mentioned COVID briefly. COVID has been a, become a very important part of this equation, I think, and this is what, why I devoted my coda to, to, coda, uh, to COVID around the world. Um, I think this is also restraining to some degree uh, Iran's uh, more bellicose um, tendencies. Now that said, um, I think that Iran is not necessarily going to abandon a lot of its friends in the Middle East, particularly on the, 
in, in, the, um, uh, in, in the Shiite areas, the dominantly Shiite areas like Iraq. Um, a, a very close friend, um, uh, Philip Smith, at the, um, uh, uh, the um, Washington Institute for Near East Studies, he is one of the leading experts on, on um, the militias, the Iraqi militias. And he actually has talked with a number of militia leaders in Iraq. He says that within that since the election, since the elections last November, as many as 20 new militia groups have grown up. These are militia groups that are being uh, supported by and underwritten by, um, by uh, Iran. Uh, and, and they will continue to use those militias as a pressure point on the, um, on the, on the Sunni territories um, to make sure that they understand that um, Shiites should not be oppressed in some fashion in these areas. And so I think that's a very important thing to understand how that's going to work. And these red lines will continue to shift back and forth until some kind of a real solid nuclear agreement can come can be arranged again with Iran. And I'm not, you know, I, I think this can happen. Uh, I don't dismiss that at all out of hand, like like some um, or some people do. I think we can. Um, I think the Iranians would like to have an agreement like that back in place, so that um, they can begin to, again, satisfy the Bazaris and a lot of the the average people in 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 Iran that would like to be welcomed again to the fraternity of of honest nations and uh, part of the of the rest of the world, rather than cut off as they are now. Yeah. Well, thank you very thank much. You very much dealing with Iran is complicated and it'll be interesting to see how the Biden administration tackles that compared to <clears throat> the last administration. Um, I'll remind attendees, you're very welcome to ask questions, I, I do have more um, myself for, for, um, to, to ask, but um, in fact, um, let's go to the first one. I think uh, Mark Tennant. Mark, do, do, you, do you want to um, ask a question? Yourself? Good afternoon. A fascinating um, uh, 45 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, my question is, are red lines ever really enforceable outside of a sort of mad, it's mad um, structure? Take, for example, two uh, relatively recent um, events. Um, there is no question that uh, in Nehru's mind, and certainly in Gandhi's mind, partition was a red line. Uh, in Mohammed Jinnah's uh, world, the creation of Pakistan was a red line. The Indian one broke. One can argue whether Manbatten broke it and all those kind of things. It broke. Um, the, there was a red line uh, in the Brexit negotiations, which was that there should be no uh, border in the Irish Sea. There is a border in the Irish Sea. I'm not convinced that when two sides look across the same red line that one or other of them doesn't has to find that red line unenforceable oh i think you're absolutely right denmark you're, you're right on uh, there's no doubt about that um, what i suggest is that the lines that really have worked is, are ones that both sides do understand what 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 the line is what it consists of what the stakes would be for violating it um, and so I'm, I'm, let's take Korea, North, Korea, North and South Korea, because that's a very clear red line that has existed for, what, three quarters of a century now already, more than three quarters of a century. And, 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 and that is a red line where both sides do understand the stakes. The stakes are um, either total uh, nuclear annihilation on the one hand, or um, possibly a toppling of the, the regime in North Korea, which they are desperate to hold on to. They, they you know... <laughs> Kim's, it's interesting, I've talked to some people who have dealt actually directly with Kim um, in, in negotiating the red line there. And, and they say, you know, the one thing that Kim wants to make sure of is he doesn't want to wind up like Gaddafi in a ditch being dug out of there and assassinated by some of his opponents eventually as his regime comes crashing down around him. That is the one thing that is very important to him, the existential issue. And I think this whole question of existential issues is very important. If both sides understand that this red line is potentially an existential issue to the other and how to prevent that from um, falling apart. I think that red line can work. I think it can hold very effectively. And there have been, there have been some, as I said, you know, NATO is obviously one of them. The North and South Korea is one of them. I suspect we're going to find that, that Brexit is going to be one of them as well. Um, both sides now understand the stakes of them. Um, they, they need to find a way of, of positioning themselves on each side of that red line so that, you know, they, they're both prosperous and, and can, can, can deal with each other in some fashion or other. I frankly was a, a deeply opposed to, to Brexit from the beginning. 
I thought it was a terrible idea. I don't know how you feel, Mark, but um, I kind of- I'm in the same camp. You know, I'm sorry? I'm in the same camp. Oh, well, okay. We're talking about singing out of the same hymn book then. So um, I, I hope it works because that, that, that is a very clear red line that's been established now um, where it didn't before. And, and um, because I think that was part and parcel of how all of Europe was created very effectively, um, both economically, socially, politically, for all of the different parties involved. And, and um, for any one of them to split off, I think, is not necessarily going to work very effectively. So I, I don't know if I've explained myself very, very yeah. well there, but um, that, that's my, my personal feeling, Mark. Thank you. Can I just ask you about terrorism? Because um, it, it's a subject that's uh, always been close to me, having, um, having studied it at St. Andrews, and, um, and also I was in counterterrorism some 30 years ago uh, in a job, but that um, the issues were much the same, frankly, but, um, but the responses are difficult. But obviously a red line was crossed for the USA um, on September the 11th, 2001. It wasn't a red line that was drawn out before, but it was an attack on the homeland, probably a, obviously a very unexpected attack, um, as is common in the US. I think your country doesn't always expect to be attacked because of its position. Um, but it's clearly a red line. We're very well in, in Pearl Harbor either against the Japanese. Exactly, but both intelligence failures. Right. Um, but how, how, how does the, the US establish those red lines for terrorism now? Because you touched on um, Iranian-backed proxy militias before in Iraq, which obviously those uh, Iranian-backed militias have been active in Iraq for the past um, 15 plus years, attacking US troops at the height of the um, insurgency but it didn't cross any red lines for Iran. Um, so I Iran obviously is, has been a state sponsor of terrorism for decades. Hezbollah is, is a creation of Iran. So, so how do you think the US especially and other states sees red lines relating to terrorism? Vigilance. I think that's vigilance and intelligence. And I think that's what's very important is that people need to understand the states on both sides. And they need to understand the people who are uh, potentially attempting to violate these red lines or attempting to uh, enforce them. And, and I think um, it's very interesting. You mentioned um, the Middle East, of course, that's, that's the, the, the heart and soul of, of uh, terrorism over for the past decades. But the, looking forward, I think we, we can't forget Africa. And Africa is where a lot of these uh, terrorist leaders who have been mm -hmm. basically forced out um, of, uh, of the Middle East, of um, Syria, Iraq, Mesopotamia, um, that's where they're landing, that's where they're pitching up now. And they're finding very fertile ground there for their activities and potentially for basing themselves for activities beyond their frontier because terrorism is obviously now a global issue. And, and it's interesting you, you raised uh, one of the issues that you raised. Um, I, I'm going to suggest something that's always puzzled me for years. I've never quite understood why um, North Vietnam never attacked the United States. Why didn't they, for instance, sail a a small rubber dinghy into New York Harbor, uh, loaded with explosives, and um, attack America. They never did, or San Francisco for that matter, if they didn't want to go all the way around uh, yeah. and attack New York. Um, it, it really kind of astounded me that they would never do that. They always considered this a, this was a homegrown battlefield and that was it. Um, basically, this was a red line that they had established themselves, thank God, and, and that never was uh, violated. So. Um, I think that um, going forward, though, I think we really need to understand um, who the different parties are. And, and that's why people like um, uh, the folks at um, the, the, the Washington Institute uh, for Nearest Peace, with Phil Smith and so on, why those people are very important and need to be understood, because they really have a sense of a grip on what the scope is of, of, of and how far Iran is prepared to uh, finance and, and underwrite the, um, these militias and their expansion and growth. And that occurs both in the in the Middle East, of course, and in where, wherever else they're being they're expanding to, and, and Africa is, of course, one of the, the principal territories. I think now. Thank, thank you very much. I, I hope you don't mind, David, but we're going to challenge you um, to think uh, way outside of um, geopolitical red lines that uh, that we started off with. And uh, I think a fascinating question from Guy Job. Guy, would you like to ask this yourself, or, or would you like me to ask it for you? Guy, would you like to? I'd be happy to ask it myself, thank you. Please, thank you. Uh, um, David, I just wanted to ask, uh, 
what are the characteristics of red lines in space, mindful of the military hardware and socially essential uh, bits of equipment that are up there these days? Oh, I think that's really a big, that's, that's a very important point, a very important question. Um, I think those are just being established right now. And I think they're being established because um, the, the, um, the, all of the players are not yet ne necessarily in place. China is just really beginning to establish itself militarily in space. Um, Russia obviously has for some time, the United States has for some time. Basically, everybody is kind of like um, sort of doing a, a, a minuet, a pirouette around each other. No one wants to engage particularly, but everybody is fearful of what happens if they do engage. Uh, so, you know, what would it take to knock out um, someone's, um, you know, uh, ability to, to see down on the, on the world? We, we still have U2 spy planes flying around, believe it or not. I actually did a column about them for CNN about a year and a half ago. Um, but, but, but satellites are the principal means of, of, of establishing what's going on in various countries around the world. No one wants to necessarily blind their brother for fear that that will be seen as a prelude to an attack in some fashion. So I think there are these red lines that are beginning to be established. I don't think anybody's really figured out exactly, you know, what's involved, what the stakes are on either side, or indeed what the capabilities are on either side. And that's what we really need to understand going forward. And I think over the next four, five, six years, I think that will be a, a very important force. I, I, I hate to give that, uh, Donald Trump much credit for it, but I think the establishment of a, a space force is, is really a step in the right direction, just as development of an AFRICOM, uh, African command was an important military move as well several years ago. Does that help, Guy? Well, that cer certainly helps. Thank you. And it uh, gives us uh, food for thought. Thank you. Thank you, David. We have another interesting question, which, which I think goes back to this madman strategy. And um, Charles uh, Pignal, would you, would you like to ask this yourself? Yes, sure. Hi, David. How are you? How are you, Charles? Yeah, very well, thanks. Uh, absolutely fascinating talk. Thank you. Uh, I guess my question, yeah, relates to Donald Trump. And I think Roddy uh, raised the, the concept of the, the madman, like Nixon, uh, and in a way, Donald Trump shattered so many norms and red lines, and, and there just seemed to be no boundary into how far he was going to go in anything. Uh, I, I could cite 50 examples off the top of my head in, in where he just destroyed uh, you know, foreign policy conventions. Uh, do you think that was a, somewhat intentional and part of a strategy of, by him and his team to gradually erect a, a reputation of being a madman or, or was it just his ignorance and, and no knowledge of history? I, I just don't think Trump was smart enough to have a strategy in anything. <laughs> that's, that's, that's unfortunate. I mean, Trump never did really have a strategy. To have a madman strategy would suggest that you had a strategy in some fashion or that there was some sentient uh, mind actually um, pulling the strings behind the curtain. And, and first of all, I don't think any national security advisor really was around long enough uh, to establish that kind of a, um, um, to establish a real, Henry Kissinger used to love calling it a Weltanschauung, a worldview. There are very, very few presidents who've really had a, a worldview in that respect. Nixon was one of them. Uh, and, and in fact, it was one of his great strengths um, uh, beyond just being a madman as well. On, on, score of different issues, but, um, but th the problem is, is that um, Trump is never really able to understand the world as a whole and all the different parts and how they fit together and, and meshed and, and how they would work together and how perhaps one part considering that if someone was a madman might have be a, a very important way of, 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 of evolving uh, a strategy and so on. But um, you really have to have a very good understanding of, of history, of how the world works, how different parts of the world work, how different people understand how, the, how strategy works. In other words, the Chinese understand, the Chinese under, understanding of, of, um, of, of global affairs is very different from the, the American or the Western understanding. It goes back, or it has a continuum going far back, back a thousand years or more. And it, it's, it's, it's been gradually developing over time. It's not simply a creation of the, of the current communist mindset. And oh, that has something to do with it, certainly. It's a sense of China wanting to be viewed as an important power and the importance of that. Somehow a madman strategy doesn't 
fit into that. You have to recognize what the Chinese want, what they need, and, and, and how we can satisfy it without denigrating our own needs and aspirations. And I think that's the critical, really critical point of dealing with China. And, and in fact, we're dealing with almost any other power is understanding what their needs are, what they expect, what they want, and, and how, can we, how can we help them satisfy that without, again, denigrating our own national interests. Does that help, Charles? Yes, thank you very much. That was brilliant. Uh, Roddy, back yeah, to you. Yeah, David, I, I have a, another question on China, and we are actually getting towards the end of our hour, <clears throat> so I'm conscious of that. There's a sort of there's a there's a moving red line being created, of course, by the Chinese as part of their Belt and Road strategy. We know that they land countries that that uh, cooperate with them with, in many cases, very substantial debt since this, this, this funding is due to be repaid. And a good example of that is what's happened in Sri Lanka and also in Djibouti. Um, can you just give us your views on where that's all going to lead? Well, it's interesting. I, I talk about, a bit about the, um, what the concept called the string of pearls. The Chinese have this concept of a string of pearls, of, um, particularly in the Indian Ocean, because they've expanded their sense of their potentially their backyard to the Indian Ocean. So they've attempted to put uh, dot uh, military bases around the, the fringe of the Indian Ocean. So they like uh, Sri Lanka, they have one, Pakistan, Djibouti, um, on the west coast, on the east coast of Africa. Um, and in each case, it's been they've been placed in play in, in, in locations where they've had a tremendous amount of, of um, they've loaned these countries a tremendous amount of money, or they have built um, emplacements for them that the these countries can't pay for. Um, and so eventually, they come to them and they say, Well, you know, I mean, you owe us all this money, but um, what if we simply take this out? We'd love to put a little military base here in Djibouti. Yes, it's right next to Camp Lemonnier, which is the American military emplacement there. But, you know, there's a nice empty place, a spot of land there. Um, we can build a very nice military camp there. And that'll satisfy, you know, a good part of your debt to us. So it was, it's a, been a very, very shrewd move by the Chinese in that respect. And I suspect that they'll continue doing that in some fashion or other uh, around the world. So. Um, yeah, I think that's um, that, that that is something we have to be very conscious of in the future going forward. But on the other hand, we have Diego Garcia in the middle of the Indian Ocean, where I spent a very lovely um, twelve hours um, back in the nineteen seventies of visiting. But okay, anyway, that's another whole story. I think we have one one or two more questions, though, and we're getting yes, started. we do. It's uh, warmed up slowly. But Aidan, I think uh, Aidan, who um, is one of our student ambassadors, actually, uh, Aidan, are you on? Would you like to uh, unmute and um, ask a question? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll ask it. Um, so, yeah, my question was kind of jumping off of uh, Guy's question about um, space, but moving into cyberspace. Um, and also, you mentioned earlier about um, Estonia and the cyber attacks in Estonia. And my thoughts are that as we move to a more kind of interconnected world, and obviously we've had cases of um, with the US elections with interference online and through computer networks, do you think that we'll see cyber red lines in future where we have these lanes that uh, actors can't cross, um, you know, through hacking or through cyber propaganda and things like that? Oh, sure. I think, and I think there's already a, a very clear sense of that. And I think that's one of the things that the, um, United States and the West European countries have been tempted to, um, um, shall we say, um, teach um, Russia and, and Putin and some of his minions about uh, that you can't, you simply cannot, one of the red lines is you cannot cross that red line uh, and, and interfere in our elections. It's just not, not on, it's not acceptable. So um, I, I think that's, that is an important issue in the future. We have to really, um, we have to help people understand what is cyber red line, what is crossing a cyber red line, what does it mean? And, and where does it, how far does it go? Um, and, and I think that, uh, I, I, I hope that um, Russia will be sufficiently um, aware of this. I hope the Chinese will be sufficiently aware of this to restrain their, their base or instincts. Um, I think it's very interesting because one of the other things that, um, that Michelle Flournoy told me was that um, she thought that uh, Russia really needed to, um, needed to go halfway because it needed to at least begin to approach us. We can no longer have a, a reset with our relations with Russia, or with China for that matter. We need to have them understand that there are certain things they need to do, um, certain restraints they need to put on themselves in the cyber area and in a whole lot of other areas. Um, and then we can begin to have a dialogue. Then we begin to, 
can begin to uh, lift sanctions and so on. And, and I think that's very important. Red lines in general, people on the other side of those red lines, some of which we've set up, some of which have been mutually established, they need to understand what the stakes are of violating and what the benefits are of respecting them. And I think that's critical to the future. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, um, David, thank you very much. Um, Roddy, could, would you like to say anything else? Any other more or, or we can keep going? We're just coming up to the hour and conscious and um, people may need to get off for meetings, etc. Well, there are masses of questions, but if there's someone else who's got a question, do please take that. Now, I think you might have got one from someone who said that they'd like you to read it out. Did you get that about checkers? Uh, yes, yes, David, I think you can see that as well from, from Pamela. Um, and and as, as Trump is no longer in office, we, we can ask this sort of question uh, with abandon. It seems like Trump could only play checkers when other world leaders are used to playing chess. Uh, are you saying Trump couldn't grasp all of the implications of his moves? David? Oh, I think there's no doubt about that. that that's actually my, my brilliant wife, actually, who's asking that question. I'm delighted to have her with us. And, um, <laughs> She always asks me the best questions, and <laughs> often ones I can't answer, but I can answer this one for sure. I think that not only can Trump only play checkers, I think that, that he was coming up against world leaders who uh, were playing actually three-dimensional chess, and I don't think he even understood, remotely understood even the concept of that game, let alone how to play it. And I think that's the, that's the principal concern because he had, he always used to say, I know better than anybody else how this is going to work, how it should work, and nobody can tell me any differently. So. He, he just simply wouldn't listen to, you know, people who really did understand how the world worked and how Western, how, how foreign leaders uh, wanted to make it work effectively and how it had worked in the past. But he never understood history. He never read history. He never wanted to learn about history. And if you don't study history, as I try to explain in, in this book and in my last two or three books, then we're certainly condemned to um, repeat it. Roddy, um, could I hand back to you, please? Sure, sure. Well, I'm the sort of the, the bookend now, David, because it's my uh, my job is to thank you for having uh, given us some very interesting and thought provoking ideas. You've prompted a number of questions from those who've been involved and listening, and um, uh, and I'm sure we look forward to the next book coming up uh, from you. But uh, analysing how the new administration in the United States deals with this how the UK tries to find a role for itself outside Brexit. And I agree with you and Mark Tennant that it was an extremely bad idea. And we've now sort of separated ourselves from what was the largest trading bloc uh, in, in the world. And I think that will result in the UK's position being uh, diminished going forward. And it was quite unnecessary. And we are now between a rock and a hard spot with the COVID pandemic and the consequences of Brexit. So uh, in, in thanking you very much, David, uh, for, for leading us through this interesting discussion today. Um, uh, I, I am most grateful and to the others who've been participating today. And, and if you would like to say anything in signing off, we would love to hear it. No, all I would like to do is first of all, to thank uh, the Asia Scotland Society. I had no idea it even existed before this. So I'm delighted to have, have learned about it and be involved in the, this institute. Um, I would also plead with anybody who wants to um, uh, buy my book and read it. If they would give me a nice five-star review on Amazon, that would be a great help. And by the way, we have a wonderful podcast that has just started. The second episode just came out last Monday. It's coming out every second Monday uh, over the next uh, six months. And um, it's, it's basically on the book, but it has some wonderful sound bites, interviews, and other things that um, uh, elaborate on the book. And uh, that's available uh, at uh, Apple Podcasts. It's an evergreen podcast on, on Apple, Spotify, and so on. And again, a five-star rating would be appreciated. <laughs> Thank you. Well, when, we, when we're able to move from virtual to actual meetings, you and Pamela will have to come and visit us in Scotland and sample some of those wonderful single malts. Well, we're getting our second uh, COVID shot on, on February 3rd. And so they tell me that within uh, a month after that, we'll be ready to travel. Very if, good. If the well, EU will have us. Well, we will look forward to welcoming you. So on behalf of everybody, thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Thank you.